Machine here, and you're watching Thorin's YouTube channel. 20 minute video for two minutes worth of content. Gold. The French CS score scene was infamous due to the teams that Happy and Shocks led for their reliance on force buying, gambling on poor economic odds in order to try and get an edge. But CS Money has no gambling whatsoever. It's a skin ecosystem where, speaking of buying, you can get the cheapest prices on the market due to them offering a constant 20% discount when topping up funds to buy through their site. Now, the French CS goal scene has had a very unusual relationship with its star players, its superstar names, the greatest players it's ever produced, as I would say France's greatest Counter-Strike sons. It's got a very interesting way, at least you could say, of modeling how these players fit in. They don't use my model of like the superstar player, the second star and the others. They instead think of players more in the team sense and want like kind of an egalitarian approach to who's the star, who's the carry, who has what value within the team. And this is easily seen by looking at the three best CS score players the scene's ever produced, right? So the obvious ones are Shocks, Kenny S, major winners, great players of all time, top 20 type players each year. And then you go, and more recently, it's Ziwu, right? Best player from France this year, without a doubt. Well, this video was initially spurred by a kind of bizarre answer that Alex, the current in-game leader of Vitality, gave in an interview at the Major, the Starladder Berlin Major, the first big Major where Vitality's core was considered the number two team in the world in the rankings and expected to do great things, but actually ended up underwhelming, only came fifth to eighth and ended up cutting MBK right afterwards. So during the Major, this is after the portion where they'd already lost the best of three to ends quite shockingly, but they did get out of the group anyway, three to one. There was this interview answer by Alex on HLTV.org where HLTV.org asks him, going back to yesterday, you lost to Ents for the first time after establishing an edge over them over the course of the year. What happened there? Was it a different, was it, someone should say, what is a different Ents that you faced yesterday? Alex says, it was definitely a different Ents. They seemed like they don't care much because they know they're going to make a change after the major. We've always beat them, but we've always been really good. But they maybe had some mental blockage going against us. Now, because they don't really care, they just beat us and we played terribly bad yesterday. We weren't in a good mindset yesterday. We didn't have the togetherness and the team play that makes us a really good team. Everyone speaks about Ziwu, but if you look at most of his frags, everyone is flashed and stuff. So it's like, I don't get the whole thing. But yeah, we weren't on point team player wise and it just shows and it's just how we beat top teams. That's how you have to do it. So clearly the context there is Alex is trying to talk about what makes Vitality a good team, what makes them win. And he's trying to set up that it's about the type of team they are and it's about their team play and the way they play together. This is to him what makes them a good team, makes them a team that should beat a squad like Ents. Now, yes, in that context, Certainly, what makes them a good team is not only Ziwu. He is not the reason they are a good team. My problem is, he is clearly the primary factor as to why they win, even if they have the togetherness and people have the tactics on point and their mentality is good and they don't have a team that has no psychological edge against them. Without Ziwu's insane individual ability and primarily his fragging, it wouldn't matter that they had everything else, they wouldn't win. So to me, even though he's doing a good job shading in some of the context of what else makes Vi Vitality a good team and what in his mind makes them win. I think he's underselling that Zewu, quite frankly, is the main fragger and he has to frag in order for them to win. And that actually he's fragging to an insane degree, even in the context that Vitality is a good team. Hence why he gets a lot of praise. It's just that maybe to Alex, maybe to the other French players, they think he gets too much credit. He's the only one that gets the credit. I think in trying to offset what they see as overestimating Zewu, they're underselling, underestimating Zewu. Because this now degree, it's not just Zewu carrying that makes you win. I often made the clarif I often tried to clarify for people on the desk that for me, Ziwu in Vitality isn't the same as Nico in Mouse Sports, where most of his teamworks were terrible and didn't even know how to play the game correctly or their roles. It's not like Simple in Na'Vi, where he would frag to an insane degree, a couple of players, Zeus and Edward at times, would play quite poorly in their roles, and if they played poorly enough, it didn't matter how well Simple played, they couldn't win. So listen, it's not as, as egregious as those particular examples, but everyone knows one of the reasons this discussion really got going in Vitality is because of this image, right? It's where this is an image of the entire lifespan of the Vitality squad with those five players in that lineup. 
Online and offline, just because the online image was the most famous one, I personally would have used an offline one. But if you if you take online and offline, they've played 211 maps together. Zewa was plus 1,314. The next highest differential was plus 80 over 211 maps. That was Apex. Everyone else was... Um, oh, and then you had RPK after that was plus 12. Alex was minus 5, and NBK was minus 26. Now listen, if you go and look at Zeus's from Narby, his is a massive minus, and then Simple's a massive, massive plus. But the point is, yeah, aside from Zewu, it's all about just doing your roll, doing your job. But the guy did get an ultra insane amount of frags in the relative of his own performance, and in the context of who's in his team, and the fact that they don't frag anywhere close to that level. The Apex is nowhere close to that kind of a differential. So this is really egregious to then imply like, nah, I don't know why people keep going about Zewu in this scenario like you do it makes a lot of sense right now the reason this is interesting is listen Alex is a young in-game leader he's pretty fresh to the roles fresh to the top team top tier of the French scene you might think maybe it's just Alex maybe he misspoke in this particular scenario but actually as someone who's been I'd say to some degree embedded within the French. I've known many of the French players on a personal and professional level. I actually think this is interesting because it ties into something I've observed over the years, which is there is actually this historical trend that players who've been in teams with great players in the French scene tend to downplay how hard those players carried or how good they were individually. So it has to do with the fact that the French scene sees the game very differently. So who are the two biggest stars in the history of the French scene? I mentioned them earlier on, didn't I? It's Shox and it's Kenny S. And quite frankly, most of the top players have played with those players. Well, there are two examples of those players themselves being downplayed. One's a public one, one's a behind the scenes one. So we'll go first of all, let's go way back in time to the original hard carry of the French scene, which was Shox. So if you go back to 2013, NIP had beaten the very game squad every time they'd beaten them on LAN, then along, and they hadn't won any big tournaments as a result at tournaments where NIP was attending as well. They brought in shocks. Quickly, they won their first big LAN EMS1 summer, which was not facing NIP in the final. Actually, Virtus Pro with Dorsia and, and Guardian, etc., beat them in the semis, and then very games beat that team in the final and won the tournament. Now, at the time, everyone said, well, that's just because NIP, you didn't play NIP. True, but they also, it is significant to win a LAN that has NIP in attendance. They hadn't done that. Now, after that, they had one more big loss on LAN to NIP, which was at Dream App Bucharest in the quarterfinals. But after that, the Shocks lineup overwhelmingly won against Snip. They'd won the majority of their series against Snip during this particular time. They only lost two big ones. One admittedly was at the major. And so as a result, you look back on this era and it's easy to see that why people hailed Shocks as the best player in the world, why Very Games became the number one team, why they were able to dethrone NIP. So in that context, when I did my Reflections interview, which I'm now going to actually get, show you a clip of, so you don't have to go and watch if you don't want, but if you want to go and watch the interview and watch the whole thing, the bit I'm talking about is around 37 minutes, 30 seconds. This interview was done, it was a Reflections interview with NBK when he was at, when he was no longer a teammate of Shocks. This is when he was playing in Envious and before they went and did the French shuffle where they went and made the super team in G2. And in this interview, I set up a question to NBK that's about the fact that Very Games were, became the dominant team. And so since when Nip had been the best team, that's when everyone said Get Right was the best player in the world and he was the best player in the world. This was, of course, when Shox was the best player in the world, right? And all the great things Shox did. And I asked NBK about it and I'll play the video now. It's about, it's less than 90 seconds long. So just like when NIP was always beating you, one thing that like we, we mentioned already is obviously Get Right was in his prime. You know, he was like absolutely amazing. So at this period when Very Games started to win, this is when everyone remembers Shox was at his best, and this is when he got a lot of hype, and everyone was like watching all his games. What was he? What was he good at within your team? What was? What were his strengths? Do you think at this time? Uh. I, I don't know. I mean, to me personally, I don't remember at the time one player that was really standing out because we're in the team and obviously we think a bit differently. So, so it's a bit hard. Uh, obviously, Shox was the guy with a lot of experience in the team, probably the guy at that point that had the most experience in the team. And, and yeah, a good motivation, as I said, uh, good will. And things were clicking all together. So I, I don't really know. For me, it was the whole team was working great. Uh, there was no real person lagging behind, and um, yeah, I don't know. To me, it was just not one person standing out. So I, I don't know. I, I can hardly uh, answer the question because, like, Shox is a good player, 
obviously. And each good player that is here for a long time has the periods where they were very good and you can hardly explain it. Like it, it just works good. So the key things there, quite shocking, right? His answer is I set it up in a in a way where it's perfectly fine to say Shox is the best player in the world, was hailed as the best player, he's the best player on this team. And he starts saying weird things like, to me personally, I don't remember one player was standing out. And then he goes on to credit, what did Shox have? He had experience and motivation and things were clicking. Doesn't mention anything about Shox's absurd skill. He doesn't mention anything about what a what an amazing play he was stats-wise, how the skill-wise it was amazing. The eye test was blowing everyone's mind. He was winning clutches. He was beating Nip in finals where previously they hadn't beaten Nip and they hadn't had a player to outperform get right and Forrest necessarily. Now listen, there's a context for MBK here, which is they weren't playing together at the time. They had a personal dislike and rival with each other at the time that to some degree extends to this day, even since they've played together again. But still kind of bizarre, right? To kind of almost go out your way not to give the guy any credit in the same way as Alex seemed to go out his way not to mention that Fuziwu is a monster fragger and for a level no one should expect for such a young guy. So now let's look at the third example, which is going to come from me behind the scenes, which is... In early 2015, when Kenny S was in absolute god mode, Kaylee had been banned at the end of the previous year, and so Titan, the most of the best players in France were over in LDLC, which became envious, and they won the major during that winter 2014. So Titan basically had to all in on Kenny S. He was by far the best player in their team. He was the second best French player, arguably at that time, if not the best. Actually, I had to say at the time, he was the best individual French player. And so since they only had Apex as another sidekick, and then they had Maniac Existence, and they had to bring back RPK out, of retirement they loaded all the resources into kenny and he went fucking ham and i actually think until simple came along it was the highest peak we've ever seen even nico at his peak in mouse and later phase i don't think reaches it it was unbelievable how much this guy could carry in all possible scenarios for we're talking like a solid four or five months if you go back and look but you know what first of all when he was carrying in titan when i would talk to the ldlc the envious players who were his rival team the easiest thing in the world they could have said was, yeah, he's a god, but his team's shit, isn't he? That's why they don't win. They're not good enough. That would be a great way to diss their former teammates, right? Many of them had been teammates of Kenny S. Instead, actually, they used to tell me, like, ah, he's overrated, actually. You know, like, it's just because the team's built around him and they put all the resources in him. If he came to our team, he wouldn't be even half as good. Like, we wouldn't build the game around him that way. You'd see he's not as good a player. And I used to think, what the fuck? What's kind of a fucked up thing to do. We're not talking in public, like some trash talking and lowers confidence. This is like what they actually think. And of course, what was delicious was the irony that they then went themselves and recruited Kenny S over the summer and actually started out by not giving him any resources. So he was still a good player, but not as good. And then later, they had to load resources into him the following year, around the time NBK did my Reflections interview, actually, because their team had dropped off so much. He was their only chance to win was Kenny S being one of the hard carries, one of the better players. Hence why in the summer at that E-League tournament, they were able to win their group ahead of uh, Virtus Pro before they went into that ESL Cologne 2016. Then there's the whole angle that when I used to actually talk at the end of Kenny's time in Titan at that point in time, some of the other Titan players even used to do something similar. They would stress like, everyone goes on about Kenny, but you know, you're not looking at how we're setting him up or how we're playing for him or we're dropping him guns. And it's like, listen, I do do all that. And also, if you just mention that, people will bring it in. But why then make it sound like he's not carrying super hard? Like, it's not because of that. Like, you wouldn't do that if you had his resources. So the problem here is the way the French scene sees its players. I've always said the French scene is a very political scene, but it way to say it is it's a very personal scene it's a lot more about what is my individual credit how do i feel about my role in my team do i feel as though i get respect for my opponents who should get the respect and the credit how is that deserved everyone wants to feel respected and credited they're not going to be like certain other scenes that just get this guy takes gets all gets beaten up essentially by his teammates in terms of the verbal abuse and just takes it because he's stick or he's some lesser player that doesn't have the same respect they're always talking if you listen to them in interviews they're not breaking it down like we had a bad round there where we, the money went badly and we did a bad call no they're always telling you yeah we weren't feeling so great we got nervous in that moment our mentality was off it's all about emotion mentality individual feelings now the real point i want to make here at the end is it's not as sinister as it first seems like i say there's there's reasons why i can see why they've tried to swing the pendulum too far back the other way it is telling though of the way they see these players except in as much as what are the big moves that define the French scene? It's still those shuffles to get those superstar names, and they still repeatedly bring in the shocks, the Kenny S, and now they're building teams around Zewu. So as much as they might say that they don't think these players are good, 
Methinks the lady doth protest too much, cause the way they act shows they do know which way their bread's buttered. This video was kindly supported by StayFunGG, Patrick Ribeiro, Alice the Alchemist, Dean Tanglis, Alexander Rao, Blunt Smoking Anus Destroyer, Dane Cuskley, J Dobbs, Ho Chi Mao, Nate DOG, Ollie J, Tobias Bernasconi, Who the Fuck is Viathan? Special thanks, as always, goes out to Jerky's Minion. Would you like to suggest a topic or a guest for my content? Maybe you want to ask me a question in my monthly video AMA. Do you want teasers for my upcoming content, who the guests are going to be? Maybe you even want to take part in an online esports discussion with yours truly. Well, then put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today. The Patreon link is in the description box below.